Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to the left side of the aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, thanks for watching, and uh, for about the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me and that I think deserve to be important to you as well. Um, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show, uh, by all means, p uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is hoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, hoviating at AOL.com. And if you miss that, my uh, website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple times during the show. And you can do a search on that find that, go to the website, and get the email address right from there. So, and I'm sometimes slow about it, but I do answer my email, I promise. A uh, couple of things to get through this week. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, is I have to make a, a little minor correction, but still a correction. Last week, I was talking about uh, questions about the what are the limits of police power. And I referred to the case of Harvard, Harvard professor Louis Gates, of course, his name is Henry Louis Gates, so I just wanted to make sure I got that right. This week, though, um, I'm going to start with a um, quick observation about the pretrial hearing of Bradley Manning. Now, he is the soldier who is charged with uh, leaking a whole bunch of classified documents to WikiLeaks. I'm going to repeat my contention that uh, Bradley Manning is not a leaker. He's a whistleblower. In the proud tradition of people who at some point in their lives have been in a position to see evidence of official wrongdoing, whether that wrongdoing is legal or moral, and have felt compelled to get that information out where the public can see it and judge it. Uh, I think Bradley Manning is a hero. It's partly because of that that I find it sad, I mean understandable, but sad to see the way things are going now. Um, I understand the charges he is facing, potentially facing, are very serious. I understand the job of his attorneys is to get him off. But I still find it sad that they are apparently going with the troubled young man defense. They're apparently their intention is to essentially acknowledge that he transmitted the information while at the same time denying him agency. That is, you know, well, yeah, yeah, he released this information, but, you know, you can't really blame him for it. You know, like he wasn't thinking right, you know what I mean? So, um, again, I do understand why his attorneys are doing that, but I still find it very sad. Okay, uh, moving on from there. Um, I also said that uh, this week I was going to talk some about Iraq. Um, I'm not. I'm going to put that off till next week, um, except for this. Barack Obama did not end the Iraq war. Um, Despite the pundits, despite the plaudits and praise from his supporters, he did not end the war. He did not. What he did was he carried out an agreement that the Iraqis forced on George Bush in the fall of 2008, before Barack Obama was even elected, to have U.S. troops out by the end of 2011. In fact, the Obama administration spent much of this past summer trying to renege on that agreement, trying to get the Iraqis to agree to have American troops to stay. As recently as September, the administration was talking about having up to 17,000 U.S. troops stay after December 31st. So um, Barack Obama did not end U.S. troop commitment to Iraq. The Iraqis did by refusing to let him renege on this agreement. And there's one other reason why he could not have ended the war. The war may have ended for us, but it may well not have ended for the Iraqis. And I'll talk more about that next week. Right now, what we're going to have is the outrage of the week. And as I said, I can't promise to have one of these every week, but I think I'm going to try to make this a regular feature, the outrage of the week. You probably heard about these outfits, these payday lender outfits. Um, they basically exploit poor and working people who have a short-term cash crunch by giving them short-term loans that actually have such astronomical interest, or interest rates that all too often people get trapped in these loans because they can't pay off the principal. All they can do is keep up with the interest. Um, in fact, nationwide, the, uh, the annual percentage rates on these loans averages 
Um, so the result is, I said, the victims can never pay off the principal, or only the interest, if they, in fact, can manage that. I mean, these payday outfits, these are like vultures hovering over the economy, like it was some kind of deceptive swamp, waiting to see who gets trapped in there they can swoop in and devour. And, and in fact, I have to say, that's actually unfair to vultures, because unlike these people, vultures are actually carrion eaters. So they at least have the decency to wait until you're dead before they rip your body apart. Now, in Missouri, the situation's even worse. The average interest rate there for these loans is 445%. And a group of, of, of citizens, civic groups, religious groups, uh, has come together. Uh, and they're gathering signatures on a petition that would limit the interest rates charged on payday loans in Missouri to a mere 36%. Now, by way of comparison, until the mid-1990s, it was illegal in Missouri for any lender to charge you more than 28%. But, I mean, come on, 36%. How can they possibly survive charging merely 36% interest? You know, and the industry is not going to take this threat to their ability to economically enslave people lying down. They're fighting mad and they're fighting back. There's a new group called Stand Up Missouri. Uh, this is a group that's emerged, and it claims to represent, I'm quoting them now, consumers, businesses, civic groups, and faith-based organizations. But in fact, if you look at their financial records, all of their money has come from precisely six sources. They are the Wallace Management Company of McAllister, Oklahoma, the Security Group Incorporated of Spartanburg, South Carolina, Brundage Management Company Incorporated of San Antonio, Texas, Western Shamrock Corporation of San Angelo, Texas, Tower Loan of Flowood, Mississippi, and World Acceptance Corporation of Greenville, South Carolina. Now, these six outfits have two things in common. One, none of them are from Missouri. Two, they are all payday loan companies. There's also a suit going on, challenging the wording of the, um, of the proposed initiative. The, uh, the chief plaintiff, the lead plaintiff in that, is a guy named John Prenzler. He is an executive of QC Holdings, which is based in Kansas and is another payday loan company. Uh, there's also another outfit that has appeared to oppose this initiative. It's called, I love this name, Missourians for Equal Credit Opportunity. Um, it's received around $600,000 in contributions from a Kansas City-based nonprofit called Missourians for Responsible Government. Now, the thing is, because their financial statement just says they got this money from this nonprofit, and this nonprofit does not have to reveal its, its source of its donations, no one knows, there is no way to know where this money came from. Uh, in effect, this is legally laundered contributions. But none of that, I got to tell you, none of that is the real outrage here. None of that is why this is the outrage of the week. This is why. In its ads, Stand Up Missouri has compared payday lenders to Martin Luther King and civil rights marchers. Think I'm joking? Here is the text of an ad they are running. This is the, I'm quoting. This is the actual text. You had poor people who followed Dr. King and walked with them hundreds of miles because they believed in civil rights that much. In this day and time, when can we say we've seen something like that, where people are willing to leave their jobs to support something they believe in? We have that statement, actions speak louder than words, and that's why I'm here. That's why it was important for me to take time off to be here to say that I believe wholeheartedly in the company that believes in me. So payday loan lenders are exactly the same as civil rights marchers. That is the outrage of the week. All right, moving on to another outrage. Uh, it's something I expect you for Rackies. Now, despite the trend of going over in some detail anyway, there's a reality show on TLC, which used to be called The Learning Channel, but now it's TLC. It's called All American Muslim. It follows the lives of five families in Dearborn, Michigan, they're quite ordinary, except for the fact that they're Muslim. And it's that last word that had caused all the brouhaha here. This creepy right-wing outfit called the Florida Family Association called on its members to flood the, the show's advertisers with emails griping about the show on the grounds that the show does not portray any Muslim, and I'm quoting the group here now, 
whose agenda poses a clear and present danger to liberties and traditional values. And therefore, according to, well, I hesitate to call them their thought processes rattling around on their fed little brains, but therefore, according to them, the show is, and I'm quoting here, clearly is attempting to manipulate Americans into ignoring the threat of jihad. That is, because there are no terrorists on the show, because it portrays ordinary people as ordinary people, it is actually some part of some vast worldwide international communist, excuse me, Islamist conspiracy to destroy our way of life. Much in the same way that the lack of church bombings on the Andy Griffith show in the 1960s was to manipulate us into ignoring racism. Now, despite the transparent inanity of these complaints, at least two companies have done what companies all too often do when faced with right-wingers foaming at the mouth. They have engaged in what I have come to call preemptive capitulation. They gave up immediately and pulled their ads. I'll note in passing, by the way, note in passing right here that the Florida Family Association claims that 65 companies have pulled their ads from the show but as one commentator on this noted, there is a strange lack of proof. In fact, two of the companies on that list, um, Home Depot and Sweet and Low, have, um, have said that they actually only bought one ad on the show and it's already run. And three others, Campbell's, uh, Campbell's Soup, Sears Holding, and Bank of America have all issued statements specifically denying that they have pulled their ads. But okay, get, getting back to the two that did. Uh, one of them was an online travel site called Kayak. Now, Kayak realized pretty quickly that pulling these ads was a PR disaster for the company, and it responded with a really lame uh, apology, supposed apology, under the title, We Handled This Poorly. Like, like, like yeah, we capitulated to the ranting of a bunch of paranoid, bigoted wackos, uh, but, you know, we didn't do it in the best way. We're sorry we didn't find a way to capitulate to the ranting of a bunch of paranoid, bigoted wackos in a way that didn't tick you off. Well, that makes it all better, doesn't it? Now, to its credit, Kayak says that the ads uh, that it's already bought are going to remain on the show and run for the rest of the season. To its discredit, it is saying it's already decided it won't renew the contract. To its real discredit, Kayak is trying to blame TLC for the whole thing, claiming that TLC misled them about the nature of the program. They even claimed, quoting their statement, TLC went out of their way to pick a fight on this, and gratuitously adding the sneering comment that, sadly, TLC is now enjoying the attention from this controversy. Kayak scumbags. But it's the other company that's gotten the more attention, legitimately so, because it's a bigger name, Lowe's, Lowe's Home Improvement Stores. Lowe's announced in early December that they were pulling their ads uh, from All American Muslim. And when the pushback came, the, uh, the company responded with a statement even lamer than kayaks. In fact, one person, again, one commenter on this, gave what I thought was a great description of, uh, of Lowe's statement. I'm, I'm quoting the description here. You know, when you're, you know how when you're really mad at your significant other, and even though they don't think they've done anything wrong, they'll, they'll apologize for hurting your feelings, but the apology is really more about you being mad than the other person admitting they messed up? Yeah, that's what Lowe's did. It's also known as a non-apology apology, where you apologize for something without actually admitting you did anything wrong. It's like those statements, I'm sorry if anyone was offended, without ever actually admitting you did anything offensive. Um, Lowe said, as you know, the TLC program, All American Muslim, has become a lightning rod for people to voice complaints from a variety of perspectives, political, social, and otherwise. So, of course, if you follow the logic, uh, of course they had to pull their ads. The show had become controversial. Lowe's values diversity of thought in everyone. The company whined, if we have made anyone question that commitment, we apologize. In other words, we're sorry if our craven surrender to a bunch of fringe wackos has made you think less of us, because what we really wanted was to cravenly surrender to a bunch of fringe wackos and have you not even notice. The utter vacuousness of this corporate blather actually increased the pushback. There was like a petition with some 200,000 names just presented to Lowe's headquarters um, on Tuesday. 
And there have been a number of calls to boycott the company. Uh, for one example, uh, Keith Olbermann on Countdown made the, uh, the chairman and CEO of Lowe's, a guy named Robert Niblock, which uh, there's something about that name that just sounds appropriate, Niblock here. But he made Niblock his worst person in the world for an entire week. Cal Penn tweeted, our next movie, Harold and Kumar do not go to Lowe's. And New Jersey's largest newspaper, the New York Star Ledger, uh, said in an editorial that the Florida Family Association sounds like a club for bigots. And after noting that Lowe said it was best to respectfully defer to the complaints, said that as long as Lowe's continues to defer to discrimination, let's boycott this company. Now, I know most of you have never heard of the New York Star Ledger, so to put a little perspective, the New York Star Ledger is by circulation the 24th largest newspaper in the country. To put that in perspective, the Boston Globe is 25th. Um, now, Lowe's is in a bit of a quandary here because they're not doing so well. They just reported recently that their third quarter profits were about half of what they were last year, and they made a rather gloomy forecast for the remainder of this year. So the company could be pressured by a pro-justice boycott. And they are concerned about this. One way you can tell is the experience my wife and I had when we went to our local Lowe's to tell them we were boycotting the company. We spoke to the manager. We told them we had been regular customers at Lowe's. We bought everything from curtain hooks to garden supplies to plants to most recently a washing machine. That's, and that's all true. But we wouldn't shop there anymore. We suggested he knew why when he, he said he was had no idea. We told him it was because of the companies that, again, I love this phrase, uh, preemptive capitulation to right-wing bigotry. Well, he responded immediately with the corporate line about how the show had become controversial and Lowe's just didn't want to be involved in a controversy, uh, to which we responded that the controversy was Lowe's pulling its ads. Lowe's didn't find itself in a controversy. It created it. He then said something about one in 50, which is apparently referring to the idea that there were 50-something companies that pulled their ads, which first, there doesn't seem to be any evidence for it. In some cases, it's clearly untrue and uh, also shows that the corporation is basing its, its decisions on what the Florida Family Association tells it. And the fact is, even if it was true, it would be irrelevant. A wrong doesn't become right because 49 other people commit the same wrong. He then said, and this is the part that really got us, he said Lowe's fully supports the show. Um, and we said, you know, if you fully supported that show, you wouldn't have pulled your ads. Um, he, uh, he continued with the corporate line, but we told him, look, that's just not going to fly. And uh, we, we took our goodbyes. Now, the, the whole point of going through this whole encounter is that he was ready with the corporate line, which means he'd been alerted to this possibility. He'd been like briefed on what to say, which means the company briefed him, which means the company was worried enough about boycotters to prepare for the possibility. So me, I call on you to boycott Lowe's until they change their minds. And what's more, I call on you to go to your local Lowe's, tell them you're boycotting the store, and tell them why. All right, the, about the last thing I'm going to be covering here, um, since this show will be on over, over the Christmas week, I thought I'd take a little time to talk about the war on Christmas. Every December for several years now, right-wing flakes, but I repeat myself, um, they have been bug-eyed with outrage over some supposed war on Christmas that they have concocted each year entirely out of a handful of incidents, some of which invariably prove to have been fictional, which they paste together in their fevered imaginations into some gigantic plot not only to destroy Christmas, but all of Christianity. And if you think I'm overstating that, no, try this. Early this month, a right-wing website with the unintentionally self-referential name of Newsbusters published a piece that began with this quote, and I'm quoting here, Every year, millions of Christians that celebrate the birth of their Savior are faced with the attacks on Christmas, holiday trees, atheist ad campaigns, and even outright blasphemy in mocking nativity scenes. And after the introductory paragraph, the body of the piece was, was headlined, 2011, 
the battle continues. So in other words, saying happy holidays or having a holiday tree in your town or having a holiday party at your place of work means you want to kill the baby Jesus and eat his roasted flesh. Because Christians are such victims. I mean, despite being, according to the, to, according to the Pew Forum, 78% of the American population, they are, they are oppressed, abused, trampled underfoot. They're under siege. What's more, they're discriminated against, singled out, in fact. Uh, indeed, so much so that Fox News' uh, Allison Camerata, in part of Fox's attempts to promote this phony war, was moved to call out in her existential despair, are Christians the only ones being forced to be tolerant? Now, personally, I found it rather revealing that somebody would actually openly admit to having to be forced to be tolerant. But I think that actual admission is actually behind a lot of the bogus attacks on this non-existent war. The thing is, though, if these people were really against those people who are against Christmas. They really want to go after people who are against Christmas, which, frankly, for all practical purposes, none of their targets are. I mean, even, even, uh, even atheists, for the most part, have no objection to celebrating Christmas. Um, but if they really want to go after people who are against Christmas, they're going to find themselves in some unusual situations because among the people they'd have to go after are the Pilgrim Fathers, the people who came on the Mayflower for religious freedom and to establish a new country. See, one of the primary sources about the early years of Plymouth comes from the journal of Governor William Bradford. He was governor from 1621 for about the next, on and off for the next 32 years. Uh, and he describes in his journal how in the fall of 1621, a ship came with additional settlers. He, at the end of his entry for the year 1621, he says this, and again, I'm quoting, and herewith I shall end this year, only I shall remember one passage more, rather of mirth than of weight. On the day called Christmas Day, the governor, which was Bradford himself, called him out to work, as was used, which means as was normal. But the most of this new company excused themselves and said it went against their consciences to work on the day. So the governor told them that if he made it a matter of conscience, he would spare them till they were better informed. So he led away the rest and left them. But when they came home at noon from their work, he found them in the street at play openly, some pitching the bar, some at stool ball and such like sports. So he went to them and took away their implements and told them that it was against his conscience that they should play and others work. If they made the keeping of it a matter of devotion, let them keep it in their houses, but there should be no gaming or reveling in the streets. Since such time, and you need to realize Bradford was writing this in the early 1630s, 10 to 12 years after the event. Since such time, nothing hath been attempted that way, at least openly. In fact, in a bit later on, in 1659, those Puritans up in Boston, they banned the celebration of Christmas altogether. They made it illegal. That was another 12 years before that law was repealed, and another five years beyond that, till 1686, before the first recorded celebration of Christmas, which I figure was because no one wanted to risk being the first. So the idea that Christianity is equated with the celebration of Christmas is as bogus as the claims of a war on Christmas are. But that, however, does bring up an interesting sidebar, which glides us right over into, and another thing, our, uh, our occasional foray into things not clearly political. Um, why is Christmas celebrated in late December? Uh, to, the, to the extent that the Bible can be trusted as a source, uh, Jesus was most likely born in the spring. That was the only time of year that shepherds watched their flocks by night. That was to protect the newborn lambs from the wolves. So why is it celebrated in late December? Well, there were two things, both of which come from ancient Rome. The most popular holiday in the Roman calendar was Saturnalia. It ran for seven days, from December 17th to the 23rd. Uh, celebrations were held, gifts were given, debts were forgiven, public gambling was allowed. There was a lot of drinking and basically a good time was had by all. In the earliest Christian churches, there was no tradition of Christmas. But in Rome, perhaps by being influenced, by being surrounded by so many festivals for so many different gods, the idea for a celebration for a birthday of Jesus arose. But the thing is, 
in Rome at that time, Christians actually were a persecuted minority, and to openly celebrate a Christ Mass uh, could be seen as treason. So the idea became, do it around the time of Saturnalia, when it probably wouldn't be noticed within the broader celebrations. And setting the day December 25th, that very likely arose from another Roman tradition. December 25th was the day of, you'll have to forgo, forgive my inadequate um, Latin pronunciation, it was Dies Natalis Solus Invicti, or the birthday of Sol Invictus, Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. Sol Invictus was the official sun god of the Roman Empire. And the idea that it was his birthday was because it's the winter solstice, when the sun stops going lower and lower in the sky every year, stops, reverses, and starts rising higher and higher. So the date of Christmas, and at least some of our traditions of Christmas, actually come from pagan celebrations of the winter solstice. And this is not even getting into how some of our other traditions, the Yule log, the Christmas tree, are actually also pagan symbols that at some point Christian communities just kind of absorbed and adopted. Thing is, I think that a lot of the people grousing and groaning about a war on Christmas would actually be pretty surprised to discover the source of some of the traditions they're so avidly defending. Now, I've got um, little time left here, probably about a minute, minute and a half, I'd suspect. So I just want to tell you, uh, from, this is from my family to your family. Um, this is the time of the winter solstice. Uh, uh, places all over the Northern Hemisphere celebrate the winter solstice. Celebrate the time of the promise, promise of the rebirth of spring. And um, that is the roots of our Christmas celebration. It's why we celebrate it in Christmas. So to all of you, um, happy Happy Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, um, Happy Winter Solstice, Happy Holidays, folks. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you here next week. There will be a new show next week, and we will see you then with some good news and probably some bad news as well. Have a great week, folks.